Today at the National Press Club, lawyer, writer and business leader Jessica Rudd. Ms Rudd is the Chief Executive Officer of The Parenthood, an advocacy group for parents, carers and families. Jessica Rudd with today's National Press Club Address. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club today and Westpac's address. We're coming to you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. My name is Kath Sullivan. I'm a reporter with the ABC and also a member of the National Rural Press Club, which is pleased to partner with the National Press Club to bring you today's address. Our guest today is Jessica Rudd. Jess has worked across business, politics and is Chief Executive of The Parenthood, which advocates on behalf of parents, carers and families from across Australia. She's also, published, she's also a published author of two books. If you can follow today's conversation on X by using uh, the hashtag NPC and the tag at Press Club Australia. Would you please join me in welcoming Jessica Rudd? Well, thank you, Kath, for that kind introduction and good afternoon. The Parenthood is very humbled to be here addressing this joint sitting of the National Rural Press Club and the National Press Club. And I'd like to start by acknowledging country. We're here on Nambri and Ngunnawal country, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders. Um, who have been in the business actually of nurturing young minds and building future leaders for millennia right here beneath this podium. Um, so I also want to extend my respect to any First Nations people who are present today. Well, this is a daunting gig, can I say. Uh, especially because it's occurring five days after the Productivity Commission has handed down its 440 page report into the pathway to reform of the early childhood education sector. But it's also daunting because I am but four months into a six month stint as interim CEO of the Parenthood, stepping in for the indefatigable Georgie Dent, who is on a well earned sabbatical. And I've been drinking from the fire hose ever since. <laughs> It's going to be hard to do justice to Georgie's incredible work in this space and also to that of my team, Maddie and Michael, who are here with us today. I am also trying to do justice to the work of the many experts in the early childhood development space, not to mention the 80,000 parents that we represent at the parenthood. The evidence base speaks for itself, and I learnt this within my first couple of days in this gig. All children benefit significantly from participation in early learning settings. 90% of a human being's brain development takes place in the first five years of their life. 90%. Once I understood this, I found myself asking why, despite the stats and the science, why does an entitlement to education in Australia begin at five years of age? Let's unpack that. When you're born in a hospital usually, your parents are given a little book of record. Mine was red in Queensland, they're red, or they were when I had babies. Uh, and in it, you're supposed to record all, all of your developmental milestones. So you record head circumference, weight, length, immunizations. But after that, your development is no longer of interest to anyone but your family, if you're lucky, until you get a school uniform. Why is that? Is it any wonder then that one in five Australian children is arriving at school with a developmental vulnerability? It's two in five for children from rural and remote Australia and it's half, half, ladies and gentlemen, of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Children who arrive at school developmentally vulnerable rarely catch up to their peers. Whereas children who have access to quality early learning are half as likely to arrive at school developmentally vulnerable. We are living in an environment where one in 10 boys aged between the age of five and seven is on the NDIS. That's why early childhood education and care should be a universal 
child-based entitlement. It is an opportunity to give every child the best possible start in life, every child, to identify where they might need additional support and to get them that support as soon as possible. While I am certainly not an expert in early childhood development or the sector or the politics around all of that, I do have a pretty decent understanding of retail politics. And I can see with a government intent on delivering universal quality early childhood education and care, their words, not mine, how close we are to seeing all of my colleagues in this space's life, life's work come to fruition. But I can also see the political speed bumps that could get in the way of that. It's fitting that the last time I had anything to do with national press in my mongrel of a career was 13 years ago when I published my debut novel, which caused a bit of a to-do by inadvertently predicting some of my dad's political misfortune. But I'm hoping today's thoughts will prove a happier form of prescience. That book was about a campaign and spoiler alert, its sequel was about first term of government, which brings me to the theme of my address today. First terms are notoriously haunted by the spark and bright ideas of an all too recent and eager opposition, desperate to get there, but discovering post election that things are always easier said than done. The rusty cogs of bureaucracy creak and events at home and abroad always get in the way of delivering services. Honeymoons are declared over, polls narrow, and the three years worth of parliamentary sand slips through the hourglass quicker than you can say Yarralumla. They then screech into their first election campaign with the equally reassuring and sobering knowledge that very few lose government within their first term. Up the hill, Events have certainly made the life of our 47th Parliament and 31st Prime Minister reasonably complicated. We are in the throes of an inflationary cycle tabloided up as the cost of living crisis. There are two major wars underway with devastating humanitarian impacts, not to mention the economic ripple effect in this post-pandemic world. We've had umpteen rate rises and a new RBA governor intent on telling us that we still require further belt tightening in the form of increased mortgage repayments. This is a harsh sting for all the battlers out there, particularly those with young children who haven't seen their wages grow to pay for it all, but I'll get to that. While its experience of the political cycle is far from unique, this is actually a rare government. Rare because it is only the fourth government, fourth Labor government to win from opposition since Federation. Rarer still because for the deliberately few promises that it made in the lead up to the last election, it has thus far demonstrated the courage of its convictions, even when the politics have proven unfavourable. And if I might add, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for his leadership on The Voice, uh, which would have been a very hard thing to do in the current circumstances. From opposition, the flagship vision painted by this government was and remains universal early childhood education and care. In his budget reply speech of 2020, then leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese, saw the strife that working families were in and made a promise. If I'm PM, I'll make affordable, high quality education universal. This is not welfare, he said, this is structural reform. At the parenthood, this was music to our ears. This wasn't just the right thing to do for our future. It was, and still is, smart politics. It shows a clear understanding of the conversations taking place at the kitchen bench on bin night across the nation. With the kids in bed, she looks up while knotting a garbage bag. Hey, hun, um, my boss has asked if I want to pick up a couple of extra shifts and maybe go for the manager role. Oh, that's awesome, babe, congrats. Yeah, I know, she puts down the tea towel, but it's going to mean more hours. Like, how are we going to do Tuesdays and Thursdays? if we're both working those days. 
Yeah. That's true. Maybe we could try and get Millie an extra day at childcare. Um, Mum could do Thursdays. Yeah, but our centre doesn't have enough educators as it is. And there's already a wait list for Thursdays. And your mum can't handle a toddler, not with her knee. It just isn't worth it. This is the depressing conversation many of the families we represent are tackling. In a poll the Parenthood did recently with the central media, we found that 85% of two parent families say that they need two incomes in order to pay for life. After all, the average Australian home mortgage has jumped from $400,000 to $600,000 in the last seven years. Wages? No. Think of the strain on the family budget. Think of the pressure on relationships of the burden that that places on a couple. Wanting to spend time with their kids, but also wanting to keep using the skills and the qualifications they worked so hard to achieve. Before kids, they're on a level pegging, right? Each contributing to their future wealth. And after kids, her career path hits a cul-de-sac. Her work is at home, which, while rewarding, goes unrewarded. Not to mention what happens to the relationship between parents of young children and their parents. As baby boomers move towards retirement, they're increasingly providing childcare supply where the market has failed to meet the next generation's demand. Grandparenting used to be about spoiling them and handing them back. Now retirement dreams of cruises and crosswords have been gazumped by wiping bums and cutting up fruit two days a week. And before everyone picks up their pitchforks to have a go at me, to tell me that they've chosen to spend those precious early years at home with their little ones, or that they love being with their babies, or they love having the grandkids over, I say, good on you. That's absolutely wonderful. I'm stoked for you. And I too was lucky enough to have the support of my mum, who's here today, particularly when my second baby was born. She was at home with me for almost all of the first six weeks of his life. And I was also financially able, in, when my daughter was born, and she's my firstborn, to be able to spend most of that time at home with her. But that is a rare privilege. And it's not a privilege that is afforded universally, which is when we talk about you know, what we mean when we talk about universal early childhood education and care. Since the RBA started putting rates up, the average repayment on a $600,000 mortgage has increased by $1,400 a month. Rents are spiralling too. That means that families on an already tight budget need more income to cover their existing expenses, and yet half of the families that we polled, even after the latest childcare subsidy increase, have chosen to work less because of the price of centre-based childcare. Of women in Australia aged between 25 and 40 with young children, just 56% are participating in the workforce and 61% of those women are working part-time. This is despite Australia ranking first in the world for the educational attainment of women. We rank 70th for women's economic participation. 65% of women that we polled with young children who are working say that they have turned down promotions or career progression because they cannot afford or access care for their children. Australian women are being priced out of work and promotions at warp speed because they don't have access to affordable care. The overall effect of this, I think, was summed up beautifully in the Women's Economic Equality Task Force report, which came out last month. It stated that the cost to the economy of women's economic inequality is $128 billion. This is not small change. So in the middle of a skills shortage, we have highly skilled people in the fields that we need skills for, like nursing, aged care, education. But despite wanting and needing to go back to work after children, their skills are left to atrophy on a playmat full of Duplo, while their bills pile up 
their mortgages and rents increase, their partner stresses out, and their super balance stagnates. And with every year that passes by, their confidence erodes to a point where some never return to the workforce. And can I say, if you're sitting at home between a nap and your next feed and watching this, you should have the confidence to return and we need you back. But that's not to say policy isn't failing dads too. Of course it does. It hits families, it hits dads. It hits him in the hip pocket and it hits him in the heart. If you'll allow me a brief detour from my primary focus for a minute, I'd be remiss not to mention paid parental leave. Australian dads take less than 20% of parental leave that the average OECD dad takes. Men taking more parental leave is good for dads, it's terrific for child development, and it improves the mental health and career prospects of mums. The government is expanding paid parental leave from 18 to 26 weeks by 2026, which is a step in the right direction but it still really misses the mark relative to the rest of the developed world. We need 52 weeks paid parental leave, we need super paid on it, and we need it now. I digress, back to childcare, which is right to be this government's main course. The PM and the Cabinet have reiterated the government's commitment to the pre-election policy vision of universal quality early childhood education and care countless times. The rhetoric has been matched by action too. The government has invested $5.4 billion in increasing the childcare subsidy, which was a welcome cost of living measure, which has delivered a 13% drop in out-of-pocket expenses for the 1 million families currently using childcare. We've seen their commitment manifest in several major reviews, including the ACCC and the Productivity Commission inquiries to build a truly universal system. In commissioning these inquiries, the government recognised that early learning is an essential part of Australia's education system and is integral to Australia's economic prosperity as a powerful lever for increasing workforce participation. The Prime Minister has likened the size of the reform to Medicare and superannuation. It's a Herculean task, but a necessary one if we are to relieve the pressure valve hovering above families and build a capable future workforce. The ACCC inquiry has released two reports so far and is due to uh, hand down its final report by the end of the year. The September report was a cracker. I used to look forward to novels and now I look forward to reports in uh, early childhood education and care. <laughs> Yay me. It confirmed what we hear anecdotally from parents all the time. And what we found in our poll, which is that seven out of 10 parents who have kids in centre-based care find fees a prohibitive burden on their family. It also pointed out that there was insufficient pricing control, very little transparency when it comes to fees, and that the market can cannot and will not deliver for children who are living in rural, regional and remote areas and other thin markets, and the PC has echoed this in its recent report. A 2022 Mitchell Institute report found that 50% of families in regional areas and around 80% of families in remote areas are stranded in so-called childcare deserts. These are areas where for every, every three children or more, there is only one available place. Our latest report into rural, regional and remote areas, Choiceless, supports this data. In 166 stories, families told us of their struggles. We heard from Pauline, a grandma from Tamworth, who has quit her job so that she can care for the children of her two daughters, particularly her grandson, George, who is high needs and lives with autism. She is his primary carer. There was simply nowhere available within the Tamworth region for those children to go. And so Pauline is now staying at home to look after them instead of earning for herself. We also heard from Catherine from Rainbow in rural Victoria, whose husband run, runs a sheep and dry cropping farm. And Catherine is a qualified teacher. She hasn't been able to work as a teacher since her two little boys were born and her eldest is five. There's been no care within Kui. This is despite the teacher shortage in their community. 
Kids from Broome to Bendigo are missing out on social health and, and educational benefits. Workforce shortages in critical service areas like health and education worsen when parents can't return to work and towns suffer as a result. When we launched our report, Choiceless, two weeks ago at Parliament House, it was heartening to see that politi politicians spanning the political spectrum showed up for this event, to listen to Pauline and Catherine and their stories. This issue is too crucial to be ensnared in party politics, and it's why both the ACCC and the PC propose that governments consider a market stewardship role and more intervention in thin markets like these ones. We agree. These families cannot wait any longer for the private sector to deliver what the public must. In addition, the ACCC and the Productivity Commission both found that the activity test, which has required parents to demonstrate their activity in order to gain access to the childcare subsidy, just succeeds in further disadvantaging disadvantaged children. Its goal was to incentivise parents to rejoin the workforce and it, has, it is clear that that has failed against this measure. The activity test, folks, is a policy lemon. We've had eight consecutive reports telling us that. We don't need another report before the government fixes the activity test once and for all. This could be done today and definitely needs to be done by the next budget. Pleasingly, the productivity commissioners have recommended that all Australian children under five receive a minimum entitlement of up to three days of education and care each week. The PC also recommends increasing the childcare subsidy from 90% to 100% for families earning less than $80,000, making care and education free for the least advantaged 30% of families in our country. These two measures alone would be transformative for children and their families. The Productivity Commission has also rightly identified addressing the crisis in the early childhood workforce as the most urgent priority for reform. Australia is currently grappling with a severe workforce crisis in the early childhood education sector. There are more than 20,000 vacancies in the sector overall. And last month, we reached the unfortunate milestone of hitting 8,000 monthly vacancies, which is a terrible shame and puts an enormous pressure on the system. In the last year, new vacancies for educators rose by 10%, while vacancies for aged carers fell by 10%. Amazing the difference a 15% pay rise can do. When I started doing this job, I was astonished to learn that a Cert III qualified early childhood educator has a take home pay of $500 less a week than an entry level bricky labourer. What kind of message does this send these passionate early learning professionals who turn up for our children day in, day out, who carried this economy through the pandemic because of the essential service that they were providing? They try every day to create a safe, fun, welcoming first educational experience for our children. They identify potential red flags in childhood development and try to address them by bringing in allied health support. They enable other women to build their economic independence while they themselves can't afford to survive on the income derived from their service to our children and our economy. Let me tell you Jamie's story. Jamie's a mother of two from Northern Queensland. Right now she's stuck. She's an educator. She can't afford to stay in the sector because she can't afford to pay her bills on her low, low wages, but she also can't afford to leave the sector because she's got her own children in early learning and she gets a staff discount. Jamie can't afford to leave and she can't afford to stay. Another educator, Yuko, has just taken her own children out of early learning for most of the week because she can't afford the fees. Her husband is between jobs. There's no way their family can afford the early learning that they want to provide for their children on an educator's wage. There is no early childhood education without early childhood educators. Many early educators are deciding to leave because they can't afford to stay, but Australia cannot afford to lose them. 
There is currently a multi-employer bargaining process that's before the work, Fair Work Commission. And it's supposed to be fixing educator wages with a government funded wage rise in line with the aged care industry. This should be a top priority for government and we look forward to seeing what they come up with. So where does all this land us? Right here in Canberra at the epicentre of Australian politics. Political reformers like this Prime Minister face far more resistance and require far more core strength and agility than their Pilates equivalents. They must stare down their critics and forge a path through to deliver on ambitious agendas, even when those critics are their colleagues who might seek to temper that ambition in favour of political survival. And I get that. I get that as an instinct, particularly when you can see that there's a lot that could be done in a second term. So political survival matters. I'm lucky to have had a window into these sorts of political dilemmas. It helps me bring empathy to my current role at the parenthood. But the empathy that I have for policymakers is trumped by the empathy I have for parents of young children every single day. And this is why the government must stick to its guns. It must persevere with what I hope will be its legacy. It's an education reform. It's an equality reform. It's an economic reform. Parents, regardless of political alignment, universally support reform in early childhood education and care. All parties and crossbenchers should unite behind the government in prioritising efforts to secure universal early childhood education and care for their constituents. Few have summed it up better than the new Productivity Commission Chair, Danielle Wood, when she was at the Grattan Institute last year. She wrote, Cheaper childcare could be a long-term shot in the arm for our nation's sluggish productivity, which has been flatlining since the GFC. Enabling women who want to participate more in the labour market would deepen our pools of talent and boost national productivity. She continued, the other productivity benefit is longer term, but even larger. With Australia's school education results declining, and the gap between disadvantaged and advantaged students widening, affordable access to early learning will help boost educational performance and opportunity. Making childcare cheaper, she concluded, is a rare win-win-win policy. It helps to relieve short-term cost of living pressures and medium-term labour shortages, and it contributes to a long-term vision for productivity growth. Danielle Wood is right. The Prime Minister is right. This epic reform is legacy material. It's a reform that will deliver immediate benefits for families on cost of living, but it is also a reform that will build our future capability and it's an investment in the leaders of tomorrow. Australia should be the best place in the world to be a parent and raise children. We're the country of Bluey, for goodness sake. We've got mangoes and verandas. We've got the oldest continuing cultures in the world. We're resilient, we're diverse, we're vast and we're bold. This government is right to have an audacious goal for us of universal quality childcare, like Medicare, like superannuation. It's really worth fighting for. So if I can dust off my crystal ball for a minute, I'll share with you my forecast. It's 2025. The Albanese government has gone to an election having funded a wage increase for educators and fixed the activity test. The Treasurer has adopted the final recommendations of the Productivity Commission's 2024 report and is investing billions to deliver a truly universal system, giving every Australian a birthright to early childhood education and care, regardless of their postcode or what their parents do for a crust. A new Early Years Commission has been established and the Commonwealth and the states are working through a national partnership agreement in lockstep to take responsibility for delivering longer term reform, addressing affordability, transparency, quality, inclusion, access and flexibility, leaving no child behind. Would-be educators flock 
to the sector. Women's economic participation increases in line with the best of the OECD nations and educational outcomes for children improve exponentially, supercharging the Australian economy and growing its future workforce. Global economists praise this reform as the most successful example of anti-inflationary policy architecture in history, and Prime Minister Albanese is long remembered for being right to have thwarted those first-term jitters and had the courage of his convictions. Thank you. You've certainly been a prophet before, so uh, <laughs> there'll be plenty of people in the room hoping, um, hoping you're right. I wanted to ask you about your relationship with those at Parliament House. You mentioned they're happy to come when you have events, when you present case studies. It's easy to say that you support uh, this sector, made up largely of small children and grandparents who, if they're not voting already, will vote one day. How have you found your relationship with this new government? It's been a, a really great relationship, um, both with the new government and also with all parties and crossbenchers. I mean, we have found every time we go to Canberra um, and tell stories, we, we like to bring people with us. Uh, we like to bring parents with us so that they can tell their stories. And it's really hard in politics when you hear from the horse's mouth what people are going through to sort of go, oh, yeah, but the market will fix it because the market hasn't fixed it. And that is the reality. You know, The reality is that the market has failed parents and failed children every single time. And so you know, when we rock up to speak to ministers, backbenchers, anyone who will listen, and we're bringing along with us Steph from Kangaroo Island, who after the fires have ravaged her farm in Kangaroo Island in South Australia, um, she needed somewhere for her little ones to go to so that they could be safe while they figured out how to rebuild. And what Steph found was that there was nowhere to go. So it took her applying for a, a grant through um, the South Australian government's fires kind of rebuilding uh, fund to put together her own childcare centre, <laughs> um, which she built and her children will never see the benefit of it because they're far too old now. But it's just staggering when you hear that kind of a story of what parents have to go through every single day just to get this juggle struggle sorted. I mean, it's mind boggling. The mental to-do list that is just kind of scrolling through our minds is so stressful. Why are we doing that when we need their skills back at work and we need this work future workforce to be so well educated? And I think she actually relied on bushfire bushfire funding to get that centre. She did. Yeah. yeah. How do you respond? You'd mentioned more than 160 case studies. Mm. How does the parenthood respond if you're on the other side of hearing these stories, which obviously vary, you know, a regional centre like Tamworth is very different to Rainbow or, or a remote area. Yeah, well, I'd like to give a little shout out to Maddie Butler from our team who did all of that really hard work in pulling those stories together. And literally went around um, with her boots and uh, her laptop and a camera to try and capture 166 stories from Australians living in rural, remote and regional communities. And every time you hear one of those stories, it's absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, I think the other thing that we don't focus on enough when we talk about all of this is the mental health burden that it takes on families who simply don't have another option. So for some of the families we spoke to, um, they were dealing with things like postnatal depression and anxiety and the impact of not having an option, not having anywhere to fall, nowhere to get respite, particularly during harvest seasons, was so harrowing to hear. So. Yeah, it, it just rocks you to the core and it makes you really want to come down here and do something about it, which <laughs> right we're on. doing. Julie Hare is from the Australian Financial Review. Jess, thank you so much for your speech. Uh, Julie Hare from the Australian Financial Review. Um, the ACCC has put out two reports, as you mentioned, and they point to price gouging. Um, as you just mentioned then, um, the whole sector is, is characterised by market failure that in very um, wealthy suburbs, there's a lot of childcare centres and then we have childcare deserts. At the same time, we have a mixed sector in terms of the types of providers, but we know that big 
for profit providers charge 11% more than smaller providers, and medium sized providers uh, charge 9% uh, more. Um, what advice would you, as someone on the ground with close um, relations with parents, say to the ACCC about price gouging, where it, which has been higher than the actual rate of inflation, and how does the government control that when we're looking at additional subsidies? It's a terrific question, and thank you for it. Um, so what we found is when the government put the childcare subsidy up, and that came into effect on the 10th of July this year, which was when I started my job <laughs> <laughs> at the Parenthood. It was a big week. Um, what we found was almost immediately uh, a lot of providers started putting their fees up. And some of those fees were perfectly reasonable. You know, parents are understanding people. They understand that, and a lot of them run their own businesses, right? So they understand what it's like when input costs are higher, there's global inflation, supply chain, all of the rest of it, workforce shortages. Parents do anticipate that there will be fee increases in line with inflation. What we did see though, is when the childcare subsidy increases came into effect, those fee increases in some cases were in excess of 10 or 15%, sometimes even 20%. And so we had anecdotal uh, information from our supporters, parents out there, who were just shocked because they were so excited to hear that the government was putting the subsidy up, only to learn that actually most of it was being swallowed up whole by these price gouging providers. So what do you do about that? So, from where I sit, this whole sector needs proper stewardship when it comes to pricing. We have a, uh, I like the thunder. Yeah. Did somebody arrange that? It's ominous, isn't it? <laughs> I think that's a great sound effect. <laughs> I'll reiterate. What we need is some stewardship. Uh, we need a cop on the beat when it comes to pricing because there are providers who are looking for the opportunity to line their pockets. And that's what happens in a system that has been cobbled together over so many years and is no longer fit for purpose in the 21st century. I mean, it's virtually the same system that my mum and dad were dealing with when they were seeking early childhood education and care for folks like me and I turn 40 next week. It, we need reform. We need reform and we need someone to concentrate on what's happening with prices. And anyone who's trying to charge in excess of the cap and claim the subsidy needs to be able to demonstrate why they're doing that. What are they doing additionally? What is the additional service they're providing? Are they being extra inclusive, for example? These are the things that need to be looked at and I'm looking forward to reading the ACCC's final report because that's what I do these days, and also the Productivity Commission's final report in the middle of next year. Thank you. Thanks. Mick Stewart. G'day, and thanks for your speech. Bearing in mind that this is the Rural Press Club as well as the National Press Club, um, you isolated two particular areas where there's been effectively a market failure, and they are the rural areas where, where there just aren't enough uh, childcare providers, and also the the uh, lower socioeconomic groups in the areas in the city yep. where, where they're just... Uh, you know, there, there are other difficulties as well. Do we need, as there's been a market failure, is this an area where we need to say, not across the country, but just in particular areas, there may be a real case for government intervention so that the, the government could actually say, look, you, you're doing it tough, we believe in, in the big advantages of actually educating people so that they're, they're not ch children, so that they're not uh, left behind, and providing those sort of services for them regardless of the market. Nick, thank you for your question. Yes, um, so we do need intervention in thin markets, absolutely. And the PC and the ACCC have both said this. What does that look like though? I don't know, and I'm not a policy architect, I'm an advocate. I can tell you what the families want and need. I can see why it would be hard to deliver on the ground in some of these areas. I can see how in really remote locations that might be difficult. But using a combination of maybe uh, in-home care, like govies, which is used all across Australia, um, or uh, trying to lean into the schools network might be a smart way to go. I mean, if you look at it sensibly, 
you've got a universal educational entitlement for children from five and up, and a lot of that's happening on Crown land in the form of schools, why not tack on an early learning centre? I mean, these are the really sensible kind of common sense should be organised by a regional netball convener sort of <laughs> solutions <laughs> that we need. We need something practical and we need it yesterday. One quick follow-up to that, which you won't answer, is, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, money is obviously the big thing. Mm. Is this the perfect opportunity to say, we're going to invest in the future of our kids and that's why we're cancelling stage three tax cuts? Hmm. I mean, it's a great question. I'm happy to answer it, actually. Yeah. Um, so thank you for the provocation. Look, I am not sitting uh, at Treasury with a calculator. Um, and so, uh, and I'm really bad at Excel spreadsheets. So I've got to put that out there. Um, but what I, what I know is that this is an investment in our future. Uh, and if I had to pick one thing to do, it would be this. Uh, I would say that because I'm an advocate in this space. But I can see what Danielle Wood at the Productivity Commission was saying. She was saying that it would deliver for the economy, that it would deliver for education, and it would deliver for equality. Show me another policy that does all of that in one hit. We're in an inflationary cycle. People are struggling to pay for life. They need two incomes. They can't afford to get two incomes. Fix it. Hard to beat that. You should go into politics. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the Nick show? <laughs> Mark Kenny. Mark Kenny from ANU and Democracy Hi. Sausage. Uh, thank you for your address. Uh, it was, uh, I, I agree with Nick, it was a very um, uh, polished and uh, powerful performance. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it did, it did uh, strike me that there's a lot of columnists in this, country, in this town, uh, in this country. I'm one of them. Uh, but I don't think I've heard a more economical description of the sort of grim realities of a first-term government uh, as, as politics and events come to overwhelm them than the one you gave during your address. So um, congratulations. There may be some sort of familial experience in that, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, uh, you say that parenthood has, uh, the parenthood has a great relationship with this government and indeed with all parties on the Hill, I think you said. I wonder if you could just speak to then where the politics of this are really, where, where they're up to. Are we any closer to this goal of universal quality early childhood education? Yeah, thank you for your question. Look, I think we are. I think we're really close. And I can see that because the government keeps reiterating its commitment uh, time and time again, with every document it puts out, it's in the wellbeing budget, it's in everything that they say. It's not just about cheaper childcare, it's about reform. Cheaper childcare was designed uh, to take the immediate cost of living pressures off of families. And certainly there are some additional things in the short term that could be done. And I think that those things that need to be done, and they are the low hanging fruit here, are the removal of the activity test or fixing it, whichever way they want to go, and wage reform. Uh, we, we cannot do anything unless we have educators. Rooms are closing, enrolments are capped because we don't have educators. So those are the two quick fixes I can see, really paying immediate dividends for the government and for families and the economy. What I would like to see though, is that we just stop with this sort of teasing at the edges of piecemeal reform and that we actually go through the really hard task of structural reform in this space. And that's what the Prime Minister said, it's structural reform. We, we need a holistic reform of this entire sector so that it delivers for everyone. When we talk about what universal means, we mean for every child means that there is no child in Australia that misses out. Now, the current system cannot do that. It's proven that. So how do we help it? We have to redesign it. And I'd love to see a proper early years commission, something, some kind of body, as I put in my little forecast, that oversees all of this. We need stewardship. At the moment, it falls between multiple ministers, departments, states, territories, councils even, the feds. What we'd like to see is that kind of lockstep unity that we got out of National Cabinet when we needed it during the pandemic. We'd like to see that kind of level of cooperation. And finally, I think we could legislate a child-based entitlement. 
I can see that happening off the back of the final Productivity Commission report. Um, so if I'm going to issue a, a prophecy, that it would be that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And Jessica, just on that, is it appropriate that the government waits for those final reports, the ACCC and the Productivity Commission? Uh, are you satisfied to wait until those are handed down? I'm not very good at waiting, actually. <laughs> um, I think there are some things that we could wait for. I can understand why proper holistic reform in terms of system design and all of the things that go with that, I can see that that will take time. That's probably a 10-year project. But as I said, I think there are things that we can do now. We can fix the activity test. We can fix wages so that educators have a wage increase that they can live on. That's critical if we want to actually get people into the sector or for them to see themselves as having that as a professional career. I, I think that these are the sorts of things that could be done now. And I really look forward to seeing where this multi-employer bargaining process takes the government, um, because it will be good to see government at, at the table as a funder of this important economic reform. Virginia Hausiger. Thanks, um, Virginia Hasker. Jessica, thank you for a fabulous speech, really comprehensive. Some of the data uh, you've, you've given us, we know a lot of it, but it's shocking to hear it yet again. Um, I want to go straight to the how long is this going to take? Mm. You say you're impatient, and I stand here as someone who has been talking about these issues, even in this very room, over the last two decades, and we seem to be saying the same thing. We need reform, we need reform. The sector is a disgrace. Australia's position on this, on early childhood um, care, is shameful, and as you've pointed out, we rate the highest in the world when it comes to a quality of education. We know that we have highly qualified, educated women in Australia. And let's face it, ultimately, this sector has not been fixed up because it's about primarily women. And it is women who are penalised. The activity test penalises women. Uh, the, the wage issue is a women's feminised industry issue. Oh, we know all of this stuff. We've been talking about this for a long time, so I want to put to you... I'm sorry, it sounds like a rant, but... What's oh, no, please, keep <laughs> ranting. <laughs> We're all Wait, nodding. McCarthy said it's OK, so I'm <laughs> going to rant a bit more. But, no, quite seriously, I mean... Uh, there was a, 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 the National Foundation of Australian Women, who've also done a lot of work in this area, mm. held a dinner in this very room a week ago and someone stood very, in the very spot you are uh, today and she said, I am tired, we are all exhausted. I think women around Australia are all exhausted by the very mental load, the juggle struggle that you talk about. Let's face it again, it's women who carry it. Um, I'm just wondering how long it will take. What, it, what do you think it's going to take to finally say, let's stop the very tinkering around the edges you just talked about and go to the heart of it, universal, free, quality child care and child early education for every Australian child, which will support and, and, support and nourish our, our nation for its future. What's it going to take? And, and one other question. <laughs> Just a, it's a double, a double barrel one because I'm in the press club. Preach, Virginia. But <laughs> this is a genuine question. Uh, what's it going to take? I was looking at the protests in Ireland recently where once again the, the women, uh, sorry, not Ireland, uh, Iceland. Iceland, yeah. And the women of Iceland, which rates number one in the world for gender equality, every single woman went on strike for a day. Now, is it time that we do that in Australia, that every single woman go on strike, whether she be a mother or not, a worker or not, go on strike from all caring duties for a day to say, enough's enough, we've got to fix this? A yes or no will do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Um, Thank you for your question and for your passion. Uh, it is always heartening to hear um, from, from women who have been fighting this for so long. Um, and it's also, it's also really awful that you're still fighting this uh, and that some of us are having to pick up the mantle. But I thank you for your passion and your advocacy in this space. And I would like to extend that thanks to all of the other warriors here, particularly Wendy McCarthy, my chair at the Parenthood, um, and also to my mum, Therese Rain, who uh, fights in her own way and does a really good job of it. My mum said to me when I first took this role, I can't believe you're still having to do this. 
And I think that is the sentiment of that generation. I can't believe you're still having to fight this fight. And I remember so clearly what it was like for her trying to get a business up and running, trying to get a business off the ground, a little attic office in South Brisbane. You know, me and my brother, my other brother hadn't been born yet. We were kind of sitting at the foot of the receptionist's desk, desperate to get up to the lolly jar. Um, and it was a massive juggle. It took an enormous effort from her every single day. And all sorts of things happened in that time that wouldn't have happened if she'd been able to just have some access and dad had been able to have some access to early childhood education and care for us and out of school hours care and all of the other stuff that goes with it, right? It's, it's 10 years since Annabelle Crabb sat down to write the wife drought, 10 years. We are still having the same conversation. It's rubbish. So do we need to pick it? Yeah, probably. I'm a bit tired. But yeah, probably we do. Probably we need to go out on, onto the streets and probably we need to put our foot down and we need to say, enough, enough, at we, as we did at the March for Justice, enough. We actually need this and we need it right now. And if you want us to contribute to your economy and if you want us to build your GDP, and if you want us to be representing you in your diversity inclu and inclusion measures, then I suggest you support us to well get there. <laughs> Thank you. Just before we go to our next question, Jessica, uh, mm. Claudia Long from the ABC has mailed one in. Oh, cool. she, she's keen to hear your thoughts on... Um, you mentioned the example of the bricklayer and the child carer. Mm. Apart from more money for child carers, how do we attract people to work in this sector? So early childhood educators, and there are many of them in the room, and I'd like to acknowledge you and your work and your profession, your dedication, and all of the, all of the things that you do for us and for our children. Um, we, wages is the big thing. I mean, ultimately, we can, we can sort of, definitely, we can look at ways to make work more attractive in that space. It is physically burdensome. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have dropped off kids to a, a toddler's room before, but I'm so pleased to get out of there. <laughs> that is chaos. It takes an absolute saint to run a two-year-old's room, an absolute saint. And they ought to be rewarded for that work. And we need to be able to give them we need to be able to give them enough support to do their job. But it's also a vocation, right? And I, I think for too long, people have looked at early childhood education and care and gone child minding, babysitting. And I have focused here on the economic arguments today because I think some people at the Hill need to be reminded of them. But the early childhood development stats and science really do speak for themselves in this space. And I want to really thank all educators in this country for the hard work they do for next to nothing. And I hope that we manage to pull off a wage rise for you in the very near future. Tim Lester is from the Australian Council for Agricultural Journalists. Thanks, Kath. Uh, yes, Tim Lester, I'm also with the National Rural Press Club. So Jessica, thank you so much for your address today. Really powerful stuff. I've been actually tossing up whether I wanted to ask the market reform question or essentially the how do we get more men into the, into the childcare space question. And I think they are tied together. It's this question of, uh, I think it was there's the Einstein quote that says, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. You've spoken a bit about the, the structure reform and it's a big reform. I'm wondering how do we do this within the context of a market economy where those forces, that fundamental ideology still exists, but actually needs to be challenged. It needs to be challenged in childcare, it needs to be challenged in aged care, because the market doesn't work. So what does that look like? And in a way that does say to people, uh, so I, I also work in rural industries. We see lots of industries trying to expand their 
workforce and their pool by making it more attractive for women to come in there and saying this is no longer men's work or women's work. I'm not sure what those efforts are on the childcare side, I have to say. I do know that it, it disproportionately falls to women. So what does that look like as a story where we say to people, this is valuable work mm. and you should do it regardless of gender, regardless of age? Well, I think we need a, a, a paradigmatic cultural shift actually around this because what happens in our country and in other countries is that the work of caring is seen as women's work. And it, it's not and it shouldn't be and it actually does a disservice to men when we describe them as not caring. <laughs> because actually every human being is capable of care and empathy. Um, and I, this is why I really lean into what needs to be done on paid parental leave because I do think this starts at home. I think that when we have an expectation that, uh, that mum will take care of the presents for the teachers for the year or wear the goggles are for the swimming bag or um, the play date organisation, uh, the rest of it, or to use another example, what about when um, grandma needs a bit of help? Uh, she can't get up the stairs. She's going to need someone to support her to take her to the shops a day a week. If this expectation continues to fall to women and fall on women and not on men, we not only rob women of their time, we rob men uh, because we are telling them that they can't. And I think that if we had better paid parental leave structure, what we would see is a shift, much in line with what we've seen in Sweden, for example, where suddenly men can see and have the confidence that they can deliver the care at home. I don't mean this in a condescending or patronising way, but I think it is important. I think it is an important cultural shift, and we we absolutely need to see that. And in workplaces as well. I think it will be excellent in workplaces and we have Emma Walsh here from Family Friendly Workplaces today. Uh, Emma's work is critical in this space and um, the work that they do is to encourage workplaces to just embrace the family and to understand that there are times when we need to step away from work because we have to go and do school pickup because school's called and, you know, Johnny's sick. That shouldn't just be mum's responsibility, that should also be dad's responsibility. And when workplaces take the lead, when businesses take the lead, and when government takes the lead, we can achieve cultural change. It's happened elsewhere, it can happen in Australia. Loretta Wallace. Larita Wallace from the Regional Australia Institute and also a committee member of the National Rural Press Club. Thanks so much, Jess, for your address today and also for a really impactful um, tenure at the helm of the parenthood so far. Um, you've actually taken me straight back to my lounge room um, in Perth when I was on mat leave. It was a time when I actually first discovered the joys of the National Press Club uh, midday addresses. <laughs> a beautiful intellectual interlude they were. Also to a time when um, I was, my daughter who's now 12, but a single, being a single parent, working full time, paying more than my mortgage in childcare fees, looking over to the option of preschool um, as a more affordable option, but the 9.30 to 2.30 no school holidays was just too much um, of an anxiety inducing situation for me when I was working in quite a, a fast paced job. Also this morning, my daughter now 12 says, uh, I'm not feeling too well. I said, you know, if I didn't go to work every day, I wasn't feeling too well, you know, I wouldn't be there all that often. So, but I've been half expecting the dreaded school number to come up on my phone, but not <laughs> as yet. It's okay, the signal's um, really bad in here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, look. <laughs> um, look, uh, to everybody in the room, I just want to commend as reading uh, the Parenthood's Choiceless Report, 160 plus case studies um, of regional uh, parents, carers, grandparents, um, uh, facility operators into the perils of uh, the really, really complex perils they face in accessing early childhood care. 3.6 million regional Australians live in a childcare desert. Um, and look, you know, we've talked what that means in regional 
in Australia when that parent who the childcare can't open because they, kept, they haven't got enough uh, staff for the day, that parent's the, te uh, the doctor, the only doctor in the town. They can't go to work. That means all those people who needed to see that one doctor, uh, it impacts their life. And you know, the, the Choiceless report talks about the teacher who took her child to the classroom. It's really cute, but it's not something and it's, uh, that's appropriate or sustainable. Mm. Um, so what we're here in Canberra today, so it's only fair that we direct our conversation to those up in the building not too far from here. But Jess, I'd just like to um, hear from you. What do you think the role of state government is in terms of improving care options? Uh, so thinking not just facilities, but we're talking about home, um, home care, uh, uh, home daycare and, um, and schools as well in terms of helping out in those thin regional markets. Yeah, thank you, um, Loretta, and thank you very much um, for your comments about the Choiceless Report. We really appreciate it. Um, on the question of state governments, and it's a, it's a really good one, I've got to say, I don't think the parents of Australia really care which government deals with this. And that's something I hear all the time. So when I have a conversation with a parent and they tell me about their struggle, and they say, oh, you know, can't, can't find care, can't do this, can't do that. And I heard that some, something about free kindy somewhere and what's gonna happen with my three-year-old, is she eligible, can I? And when we spell it all out and we say, well, the state government is doing, um, you know, this many hours of free kindy for you for this many days a week, but the federal government uh, is not going to have its childcare subsidy apply for the bits at the beginning of that day and the end of that day in terms of long daycare. But that also depends on whereabouts you live. Have you been to community daycare? <laughs> have you looked at family? Have you looked at family daycare? There are a whole range of options, and they just look at me like. So, sorry, so what's the, what's the answer? And that's a great question. What is the answer? Like, your parents are really sick of trying to understand whose responsibility this is. And if we are really serious about a universal early childhood education and care system, that doesn't mean universal for Queensland and universal for Northern Territory, meaning different things. What we need is a system that does the whole job. And that means that that mob needs to work with all the other mobs around the country and work it out, because that's what we pay them for. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hi, me again. Um, so we were lucky enough during Canberra Writers' Festival to host a, a British journalist and writer called Angela Saini. She wrote a book called The Patriarchs, How Men Came to Rule the World. And one of the things she talks about in that book, which I can highly recommend to everyone here, is that the Soviet Union uh, was basically the first country in the world to attempt to bring around gender equality. They, it was the first country in the world to legalise abortion in 1920. It opened up higher education and technical colleges to women. It expected women to work and to make it easier to divorce. And they provided state housing, canteens, laundries and childcare. They shifted gender norms to such an extent that to, even today, 30, days, 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it is still the norm in East and Central Europe for women to work. What will it take for Australian society to get there? Do we need our own Russian revolution? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sure. I mean, you don't really expect the AFR journal calling for a revolution. <laughs> and yet here we are. And I welcome it. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that's kind of where we're getting to, isn't it? it? And this goes to Virginia's question as well. I mean, we don't want to be having this conversation when my 11-year-old daughter is looking for early childhood education and care for her children, nor do we want that responsibility to fall to her and not her kid's dad. Um, so how do we avoid this endless loop? I mean, we're working on it um, and we welcome any support we can get. And if it comes from the form of the Australian Financial Review, <laughs> I would love that because this is absolutely about the economy. It is absolutely about equality and it's also about education. It needs to be done now. We have to get this work done if we are serious about building this country's future. So thank you for your question and for the revolutionary call. Thank you. <laughs> Morris Riley. Thank you, comrade. Yes, thank you, comrade. Uh, uh, Morris Riley from the press club. Um, it is, it's a big overdue reform uh, and I think 
you're going to need bipartisanship or multi-partisanship. Mm. Have you sat down with Peter Dutton and spoke to him about this and where do you think... They might even take this up as a policy. They need some policies. So um, where, where are you going to be across the board in, in the advocacy of this uh, reform? Yeah, great question, Morris, and thanks for having us here today. Um, look, we talk to anyone from any political persuasion. Um, I haven't personally sat down with Peter Dutton, but I've only been in the gig for four months, so give me a break. Um, he's got a... <laughs> the Leader of the Opposition's office is, uh, you know, it's a pretty busy place, and I remember this from when my dad held it, um, and it's pretty under-resourced, so I'm sure we'll definitely get a chance to meet at some point. Um, I... I have been really heartened to hear how many politicians from all political backgrounds have come to talk to us and listen to us because it matters for their constituents, right? And when you look at the demographics of this issue, millennials like me, I'm a cusper. I mean, like, <laughs> let's be honest, I'm a, I'm a millennial, but yeah, <laughs> not really a millennial. But we are going to be the parents, um, the largest voting bloc will be parents going forward. And the boomers are going to be looking after children from the millennials in their retirement. So that's a very large portion of an electorate. It's a large chunk of a marginal seat. So this should be, in terms of political survival, this should be a priority for every party every crossbencher, anyone who cares about their constituents. And we look forward to continuing to speak to all politicians about this. We've been very encouraged actually by some of the language coming out of the National Party. And actually that makes perfect sense when you have a look at what the content of our choiceless report. Um, we would love to have their support and I'm sure the government would too, if it was to pursue universal early childhood education and care with a particular bent towards addressing some of the problems in those thin markets of rural, regional and remote Australia. As ever, the pressure is on. Jessica Rudd, thank you for bringing the thunder and your address to the press club today.